time, taking the ten from the mines in England and taking them to the different uh, ports all around the world. Tin was almost as valuable as gold would be today. It was a very valuable metal, especially was used in the making of bronze. And as I did the research, the historians are not even sure how, where the tin came from in England. Now, it came out of the mine, but the way all of this was produced, they said it's very complicated. Somebody had to show them how to do this, these different things. They are convinced that the survivors of Atlantis would have been the ones that settled in the British Isles and developed all of these uh, different techniques. And this is probably where the Druids came from also, the survivors of Atlantis, because the Druids were, had the biggest university in the known world at that time, a tremendous university at, Gla at Glastonbury where they taught all the different subjects. This is the same as the Essenes did. The Essenes taught all of the subjects that were known. In Jerusalem and Israel, all the person the boy was were taught was just uh, mathematics and reading and writing and the Torah. They weren't taught anything else. The girls were just taught how to be a wife and a mother. They were not even taught to read and write. If a boy wanted to have more education, he had to go somewhere else to get the training. But at Qumran, in their mystery school, they had they were taught everything: mathematics, astrology. Um, there were there were different masters, and this is where the one we were speaking to in Jesus and the Essenes was the masters of the Torah. But there was one that was called, it was a woman teacher who was called the, the, the master of the mysteries. She knew uh, how to teach Jesus and the other students that were there different methods of healing. And they said, when you completed all that was taught in uh, Qumran, which was supposed to take about 20 years, most students came in and focused on one subject, like mathematics or astrology, but it would take about five years. Jesus had to learn it all, everything that was taught at that school. And they said, when you completed all of the courses that the Essenes were teaching, you would even know how to raise the dead. Those were for the highly advanced people, students that took all of these courses. So Jesus was exposed to a tremendous amount of knowledge just with the Qumran alone. But in between there, Joseph of Arimathea was taking him to all the other wise teachers of the world. He was taking them under the disguise uh, as traveling with his uncle because his uncle had to go and trade in these different countries. And Jesus went along with him under that disguise. And when Jesus was young, Mary would also go with him. She would accompany him on these trips. And no one knew the real reason he was taking him to these countries was so he could meet the various wise teachers in India, Tibet, uh, the Druids in England. Uh, they said... Uh, China, it was what we called China in those days. But all of the wise teachers of the world, he would spend time with them and learn everything they had to teach. And he could absorb it so quickly. He, he could just learn so fast. That was the amazing thing, that what would normally take 20 years, if he would spend a year there, he would have all of the information absorbed he could put it all together. His mind was that capable of grasping everything. So he was taught by all the wise teachers of the world. And then when he came back, he developed his own technique by putting all of this together, making it work for him, all the different secrets that he had been taught. It's interesting to know that Mary Magdalene, many people have asked me about her, she was one of the disciples. Jesus had more women followers than he had men. 
And it was unusual for that day because women were very restricted in what they could do. But he found that women could understand what he was teaching easier than men because of our intuitive nature. We could pick up on it much easier where the men were more practical. And this has all been removed from the Bible, that he had many women followers and he had women disciples. And Mary Magdalene was one of these women disciples. Now, people have asked me, did they have a relationship? Were they married? I have never found anything about him being married because what I found was that he felt if he got, if he was married, it would take away from what he was doing. He could not devote himself totally to what his job was, what his mission was, if he was married and had a family. This is one of the reasons he was very lonely. But he had a relationship with Mary Magdalene in a special way. I don't know anything about a sexual relationship. But Mary Magdalene was a highly educated woman. She was an Egyptian priestess. And she had been taught in Egypt in all of the mysteries and all of the things that Jesus had been taught. So she was very uh, well versed in all of this, the healing methods and all of the metaphysical knowledge. So Jesus spent a lot of time with her because they could talk on the same level and converse about these different things. And the other disciples, some of them were jealous of her, especially Peter was jealous that Jesus spent so much time with her. And they tried to discredit her in many ways because they didn't like the idea that they spent so much time together. But uh, Mary Magdalene was a very special person, and she had a very special role to play also after the death of Jesus, whenever uh, she helped to fund the first church in the world. So a lot of this is lost knowledge that has been taken out of the Bible, never put in there in the first place. And they're always saying women can't be priests because Jesus didn't have any women disciples. And I said, whoa, that's not true. That's what they'd like to let you have you believe. But Jesus did not distinguish to him. At Qumran, they had women teachers. He was raised with this. In other countries in the world, he was taught by women. So him, he didn't distinguish between women being lower than men. So he had many women followers, but the church doesn't want that knowledge known. So that is why they're still saying, no, women can't be priests. But he respected women a great deal. Oh, there's so much to this story. But there are many other parts that have been removed from the Bible. One of them was that um, when he began his ministry in Jerusalem, they was afraid that he was attracting so much attention, the Romans were afraid that he was going to cause, be causing a rebellion and that the Jews would rise up and follow him. And they were very afraid of this because he was getting more and more popular. So many times he was captured and he was taken into the rooms and the tunnels that are underneath the temple in Jerusalem. Some of these tunnel, tunnels survive to this day. They're still down there. All that remains of the temple today is the tunnels underground and the water system that has survived since the time of Jesus that uh, you know, supplies the water to the whole area. And the lower part of the Wailing Wall, everything else was destroyed by the Romans uh, after the crucifixion whenever they came in and destroyed all of Jerusalem. But he would take, he was captured and he was taken down into these tunnels where he would be tortured and beaten, trying to make him stop what he was doing. He refused to do it. When he was let go, he would go right back to doing the same things again, trying to teach people and trying to do what he thought was his mission. So on one occasion, they captured him. After torturing him, they decided they had to kill him. They put him into a crate, and they threw him over a cliff. And it would have killed any normal person, but Jesus survived. This frightened the Romans even more, because they found they couldn't kill him. 
And you know, in the Bible, it says, whenever he died, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down. He wasn't going to die until he was ready to die, until his mission was completed. But it was after that attempt was when the disciples, they all decided to leave Jerusalem, go out into the countryside and travel and preach there and do the ministry and teach people about uh, metaphysics, about meditation, about healing, and to spread the gospel of love. He did it out in the countryside, and that was where he did his travels, because it was dangerous in Jerusalem. This explains the part in the Bible. You know what? The Romans weren't interested in following him out there, and they certainly weren't going to go into the villages of the lepers to hunt him down. He was good riddance once he was out of Jerusalem. But this explains why in the Bible it says when on Palm Sunday, when he came back into Jerusalem, that the disciples knew it was dangerous. They said you could be killed. It never explains that in the Bible. But he could be killed because he was coming back into an area where they had tried several times to get rid of him and kill him. And they knew it was dangerous. But by that time, Jesus had decided and he knew the time was coming when he was to leave the body. He said that uh, it was all right until his own people began turning against him. Then he knew his mission was over and it was time for him to leave. And that went into the story then of his capture and the uh, crucifixion. But here we are running out of time again. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't even finished most of that story. But to me, these are wonderful stories that I think should be in the Bible. They're the rest of the stories, the missing pieces. When I began to do my research, I was quite familiar with the Bible because I taught Sunday school for many years. And I thought when I began to do my research, this was after I'd completed all of the sessions, and I knew at that time, it was safe to do the research because I wasn't going to be influencing her in any way. I did the research. I thought I was going to find all the answers in the Bible. I didn't. There were many missing gaps, big holes where information was just not there. That's when I think with my, the work I've done has filled these gaps for the first time and told people the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey always said. <laughs> so that's uh, the part. I'll we'll bring it up to that part anyway, because there's even more missing parts. Maybe we can continue next week on this same story. I can get all the information out, and then I want to go into some other parts that I've started and not finished. <laughs> I think you can see why I've spoken for a week in many places speaking on all the different parts of all of my books. But if you're interested in the books and want to check out where I'm going to be speaking, you can check it out on our website, which is Ozark Mountain, www. Name my company is Ozark Mountain Publishing. So it's Ozark Mountain, and it's abbreviated, O-Z-A-R-K-M-T dot com. And you can check on the part about the schedules and know where I'll be speaking and you find out about my classes. But if anyone is interested in a private session or my classes, or if they want me to speak at any conference or anything, you can contact my office at 1-800-935-0045, 1-800-935-0045, or you can contact me by email. It is D-E-Cannon, C-A-N-N-O-N, at msn.com, 